Well, today marks the official, unofficial day that the United States achieved independence, July 2nd. We celebrate on July 4th because that is when the final copies of the Declaration of Independence were finally acknowledged. But the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America would remove the then 13 colonies from under the rule of the Kingdom of Britain and craft a new allegiance, a new independence. What is considered the most important sentence in all the English language, arguably, is we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of, spelled with an I, not with a Y. These words came to be the hallmark of independence that rings even to this day. In fact, the U.S. Declaration of Independence would flavor the rest of the founding documents of the United States, including the U.S. Constitution, which plotted the course of the America that we have today. Independence is the act of achieving sovereignty from uh, a state or an entity to no longer be under the authority of another party or to be set free from an authoritative tie. The independence of a state doesn't necessarily imply freedom for its citizens, though. Fortunately, in the case of the United States Constitution, we are each afforded freedoms that protect the citizens, since the government is for the people, by the people. And so, we live in a land that is independence, that is associated with freedom. One of the great benefits of our Constitution is that we can meet here freely this morning without being braided or without being arrested. In other nations, this would be considered illegal to open God's word and to utter what he has to say for us. To be sure, plotting the course for a nation is not an easy thing. At some point, a consensus among individuals has to be drawn out and people actually have to sit down and agree on values. So the fact that America became an independent nation is quite remarkable. Our own nation's independence was not smooth sailing. The subsequent problems of divided nation along racial tensions, civil liberties, women's rights, and most re recently, gender issues, all prove that while we are an independent nation, we have many problems yet to be resolved. Questions surrounding the founding of a nation have led me to wonder about the founding of a church. How does this thing get rolling? The thing we call church. Must the church begin similarly to the way a nation is started? Does a church simply declare, I want to be free? Draft its own constitution, establish, establish its branches of government and amend its constitution? And when a church starts, how does it uphold its values? Are there checks and balances? To be certain, the church is not a nation. And a nation is not a church. The church's declaration, the church in Christ, is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. That is what we declare as our founding documents. And we cannot amend this constitution since God word, God's word stands forever. There's no way of changing it. We must change ourselves. The way a church starts is fundamentally different from the way a nation starts. But it also has a different goal than what a nation might have. Perhaps a nation might have economical goals, goals of independence, political goals. But the goal of the church is none of that. It is not to demonstrate which political party needs the platform. The goal of the church is not to uphold political values. 
the goal of the church is not to fund its own nation, to have its own economy. The goal of the nation, of the church, rather, is to display the wisdom of God to the world. This is what Ephesians chapter 3 and 4 tells us. The purpose, the existence of the church, this local church exists so that everybody who's driving down Sheridan Street right now might look our way and say, in that church is represented a group of nations that have gathered to glory, glorify God. They sing all at the same time, they pray at the same time, and they're hearing the same message at the same time. Who did that? It is the wisdom of God. The church is to be a united nations where people from every nation, tribe, tongue, come together in allegiance to Jesus Christ, the Supreme King. So the church's values are radically different from the values that we see in our nation, in other nations. Our goal is to pledge allegiance to Jesus Christ. But that doesn't always work out, does it? There are cases of churches gone wrong. Churches that have as their founding documents the Bible, but Sam can't seem to come eye to eye on certain things. Maybe it's the carpet. Maybe it's one of the leaders. Maybe it's the parking space. Many a church have become ruined because of conflict, because of tension, because of disunity. So though we have these founding documents, though our church is founded upon the blood of Christ, unity is not easy. That's where we come to today in our passage in James chapter 4. If you open up with me to your Bibles, or you can see it on the screen in front of you, it's also in your handout, James chapter 4. If you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 1290. But James has something to tell us about the source of this conflict, the source of this disunity, and how we might fix it. James chapter 4, verse 1. James writes, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have, because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive, because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Amen. Amen. Before we dive into this text, we just need to look at what has happened before this. We have to look at the context. We have spent the last several months looking at worldviews, so some of you may not even remember what James is all about. This review is for you. Some of you do remember what James is about, but still forget, because that's what we do. So this review is also for you. The first thing we need to see is that the letter of James is written by the half-brother of Jesus. So this is closely associated with Jesus Christ himself. A lot of the language used in this book is the language that Jesus used. Number two, James was the pastor of the first church in Jerusalem. 
Number three, the letter of James is the first letter to Jewish Christians and churches spread around the Mediterranean world. That's amazing, we have in our hands the letter that brothers and sisters from centuries ago would have, in a similar setting, heard. And so we, we are very glad and joyful because we can carry on this tradition of reading God's word. But number four, Pastor James was already concerned about faulty faith from cultural Christianity. Uh, we all bring baggage with us when we come into the Christian faith. When God saves us, he doesn't wipe our slate clean, so to speak, in terms of our experiences. And so we each carry with us baggage. And this church apparently carried with it some baggage that needed to be clean, cleansed out. So this letter is written with that tone of voice. But it's trying to, uh, James is concerned with this faulty faith that is rooted in cultural Christianity. Number five, Pastor James calls out people for being religious, but not godly. Having an appearance of godliness, but it's devoid of any power. There's no power in this godliness. Number six, he was very concerned about ingenuous salvation, people who say they are Christian, but live like the world lives. Number seven, Pastor James is not focusing on theological knowledge, but godly behavior. And you see this because of the amount of imperatives or commands that is in this book. In fact, in our passage alone, in just 10 verses, there are 10 commands that we should obey. 10 commands. That's one-fifth of the total in the book. So we could say that this chapter 4, verse 1 to 10, is the center of the book. The most important part of the book. And it is a call to repentance. The most important thing James has to say to us this morning is repent. Number eight, Pastor James explodes the relationship between faith and works. So if you are a Christian, you're going to have fruit to demonstrate that. And number nine, Pastor James gives several tests to help you determine if you are a true Christian. So let's look through these tests. The first test is the test of perseverance in suffering in James chapter one. True faith, true faith grows when it is tested, it matures. Number two, the test of blame and temptation. True faith accepts responsibility for sin, does not blame God or others. Number three, the test of response to God's word in James chapter one. Do you respond to God word, God's word? In your hearing of it, do you do it? So true faith receives and applies God's truth. Number four, the test of partiality or impartial love. In James chapter two, true faith loves and respects everybody. There is no socioeconomic status in the church of Jesus Christ. We must leave that at the door. That's what James chapter 2 teaches. But then we see also the test of righteous deeds and works. James chapter 2, verse 14 to 26. True faith produces righteousness, produces right deeds, work. James chapter 3, we looked at the test of tongue. True faith has a tongue controlled by Christ. Number 7, the test of godly wisdom. James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. Which is it, godly wisdom or worldly wisdom, which will you have? True faith thinks and acts like God. Worldly wisdom has completely different values. And finally, the test of worldly indulgence, which we'll look at today, which actually goes up to verse 12. But for our time together, we will just be spending looking at verse 1 to 10. There are several observations that you can make about this text. Let's begin by first noticing the three questions that are in this text. The first question is found in verse one. Look there at verse one. It's a basic question. It is a philosophical question. And I think it is an essential question if we are to be in unity as the body of Christ. What causes fights among you? And you here is plural. It's not referring to just you and your family or you as an individual. But what causes fights among us, brothers and sisters? He is directly targeting Christians with that question. And so we need to give an answer to this question. And he does in the very next verse. But before we go on to verses 1 to 3, it's important to point out that desire, that desire in and of itself, being in this passage the root of all conflict, desire in and of itself is not sinful. Some desires are God-given. The desire to be married, the desire for children, the desire to be alone and just read books is a good desire. 
the desire for ice cream on a hot summer day, the desire for hot cocoa on a cold winter day, though that's strange in Florida. All of those things are good desires. They are given to us by God. So for instance, James assumes there are things we should ask for, but we do not, like wisdom. The desire for wisdom is a good desire. Lord, I want to know how to live practically, applying your knowledge in all circumstances. That's a good desire. But the problem so often comes when our desires are unfulfilled and they lead to sin. When your desire for a cup of ice cream leads you to begin yelling at people that you want ice cream, as children so often do. Or the desire to want to be married, so much so that you skip marriage altogether and just go straight to having consummated a marriage without having been married. Or the desire for relationships with friends, for relationships with people, but then you become clingy and you become codependent. Those desires, when they are unfulfilled, lead to sin. I think James is pointing out to us those instances where desires, where our desires, lead to sin. Think about some of the desires James has already described as leading to sin in this letter. In chapter one, the desire to not go through suffering and trials should be accompanied by joy, but often it is accompanied by complaining, grumbling, sullenness. How many of you have waited in the line at the DMV? Can I get an amen for that? It's a great example of what I'm talking about. You would rather complain than endure the suffering of next, next with joy. Maybe next time you do that, maybe next time you wait in the DMV, listen to the audio, listen to the Bible on audio. Or think about the desire to overcome temptation in chapter one, which should be accompanied by a thankfulness to God for rescuing us from temptation, but which is often accompanied by blame shifting. And everybody else is responsible for my sin, except me. Or the desire to produce righteousness in other people right? The desire to see other people do righteous things. When you yourself are not patient and kind and slow to speak, you think that anger will produce righteousness in your children, in your spouse, in your coworkers. You think that by yelling at people, they will do the right thing. And James says, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So you have to think of a completely different way. So we should be patient and kind and peaceful to get people to do what they need to do, to get people to do the right things. Or the desire to be holy and religious, which should be accompanied by a desire to visit orphans and widows or insignificant people, people that don't matter in the grand scheme of things, who we assess as unimportant. But those are precisely the people you should be spending time with the people who don't matter to your agenda, the people who do not affect whether you accomplish things. Those are the people you should be spending time with, but often we believe our religion is, is pious, and so it is often accompanied by deceit and empty words. And that's just chapter one. <laughs> that's just chapter one of the book of James. In James 4, James gets right to the heart of the matter concerning our desires. They have turned into sin and noticeable sin. Now we can see the result of the sin that was inside. It has come outside. It has reared its ugly face. Look at the words he uses to describe where passions, where your desires that are unfulfilled lead. Verse 1 and 2, there are five key words there, four key words there. Quarrels, fights, war, murder. I don't think James is particularly concerned with people murdering each other in this church. If he were, I'm sure there would be other sections of the book of James, probably be much longer. He would probably have to address that specifically. But I think he means murder in the sense that Jesus used murder, speaking evil about your brother and sister. Or the way John used the word murder to describe 
Cain's hate for his brother Abel, who then, when that unfulfilled desire wasn't met, he literally killed his brother. So ask yourself, where does my unfulfilled desire lead me? It sounds like James is saying it will lead you to chaos, to outward expressions of warfare, even murder. Now he's asking, where do these things come from? Where do battlefields come from? Where do explosions come from? These very graphic and easily identifiable manifestations of sin come from one place. And he uses three words to describe it. Passions, desires, and coveting. Passions, desire, and coveting. All inward expressions of unfulfilled desire that make their, their way outward. The very noticeable sins are caused by very unnoticeable problems. They spring forth from things that are not seen. Notice also where this fighting takes place. He says, among you, among you all. I think James is seeing this played out generally in local churches. I think the way that James is talking here seems to describe something that's a, somewhat of a consistent theme among churches, local churches. To be characterized, Christians to be characterized by fighting, by quarrels, by war, by murder. He's not talking about Senate hearings. He's not talking about school board meetings, and he's not talking about G7 summits. He's not talking about the stock exchange. He's talking about the local church. Though it wouldn't surprise us if these things did happen in those settings, it should shock us that these things happen in the local context of the local church. No, James is saying something scandalous. He's saying a church should be marked by peace, but it's not. A church should be marked by love, but it's not. A church should be marked by righteousness, but clearly it's not. The problem is right in our midst. It's in our living rooms. It's in our kitchens. It's in our cars, on vacation, paying the parking meter. This is where the conflict is. It's all around us. And you know why it's all around us? Because we each carry it with us in our hearts. James's language, as I've mentioned before, seems strong. Notice this progression, quarrels, fights, war, and the aftermath of war is murder. It's death, wreaks havoc. Jesus taught, he said, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. The opposite of that would be to love one another. So as the apostle John writes, we should be characterized by love. This is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Don't be like Cain and Abel. Love one another. So what causes fights among us? The answer is the human heart. The human heart will make war on anything that threatens its passions. The human heart will make war on anything that threatens its passions. Can you imagine being a leader in a church that is described the way James described? What would you do? I think of so many pastors that I know that pastor churches that are characterized by these four words. And I'm not sure if you knew this, but every Tuesday and Friday, when the pastors gather to pray together, 
We thank God from sparing us, for sparing us from those four words. We thank God that the church we pastor, we do it with joy because it is a joy to pastor these people. There is no sense in which we are inclined to conflict. We've seen repeatedly the joy of reconciliation in our midst. But that doesn't mean it won't happen or that we're somehow not susceptible now that we've gone through seasons of great peace and love and hospitality. Pray for our church to eradicate this heart. Pray for the pastors of this church that we would gladly serve, that we would gladly lead people to reconciliation, that our goal and that our priority would be peace in our midst, that we would be eager to maintain unity here. Pray also for other leaders, the growth group leaders. Pray for them as they care for you. Allow them to do that with joy. Pray also for your own selves that you would come here and be ready to invest in others, not seeking your own desires, but the desires of others. Not putting yourself first, but the needs of others first. Praise God that that happens. We see glimpses of grace all the time. So I'm just thankful that this morning, three or four brothers came up to me and said, Ben, is there anything I can do for you? I know you're preaching today, what can I do for you? Can I pray, can I pray with you? That is what our church should be marked by. Praise God that it is. But we should not fool ourselves to think that this will kind of be automatic, passive. We need to put forth effort to strive toward unity. Notice now the second question that James poses, and it's in verse four. It's in verse four. The question is, isn't it obvious that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Isn't it obvious that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Is that obvious to you, brother, sister? What is friendship with the world? Well, there's very strong language again. James, up to this point, has been referring to people in this letter as brother, sister. And finally, at this point, he calls them adulteresses. He says, you are a bunch of adulteresses. That is very harsh language. And I think the point of it is to jolt us awake, to read that and to be shocked. The shock value of being called an unfaithful man or woman to your allegiance to Christ is shocking. On the one hand, for a Christian to be a friend of the world is to commit spiritual adultery. It is to forsake our faithful husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are his bride. What he expects from us is what we've signed up for in terms of a covenant. We are to do exactly what we said we would do, which is to obey him. This is language that is used commonly in the Old Testament, by the way. If you go home and read the book of Hosea, you'll see that this is the picture of what Israel is committing against God. Ezekiel 16 seems to be the most graphic description of Israel's unfaithfulness to God. God says there that Israel was whoring around and that when she became prosperous, she looked at her riches and called all the other nations to herself as an adulteress would other men, and she began worshiping other gods. So viewed from the context of a marriage covenant, God is abandoned by Israel because of its idolatry. It had abandoned God and worshiped other gods. In other words, friendship with the world is a threat to our allegiance to Christ. What threatens your allegiance to Christ? What do you live for that takes the place of Christ so often? What would you give up life for? What would you die for? Is it work? Is it your family? Is it school? Is it a relationship? Is it your possessions? Maybe yourself? Perhaps you don't realize the value of these things. They pale in comparison to treasuring Christ. 
Perhaps you've not considered the ultimate supreme value of Christ. Christians should not see the world the same way the world sees it. We saw that in James chapter 3. The values we have are, are not the same as the backward values James described in James 3. Christians must see the world with the wisdom of God. They must see that ultimately God is for himself, that God exercises justice against those who are opposed to him, and that ultimately God is loving in doing so, that he reveals our disobedience, and that is a loving thing. All the glamour, the glitz, and the fame of this world is passing away, and even before it passes away, it will not be faithful to you. But Christ remains faithful always. For Christ to look upon this people, a sinful people, and to say, my treasured possession, the beauty of my bride, the pureness of my people. For Christ to do that takes grace. And so God shows us his grace in the person of Jesus Christ. This world will pass away, it will not be faithful to you. God will always be faithful to you. Friends, there are some of you here who are not Christians, and perhaps you weren't expecting what this text presumes, which is our relationship with God is an intimate relationship. It's compared to a, a marriage. James, I mean, James is yelling at these people, and he's calling them adulteresses because their allegiance is divided. That's pretty shocking. So that may surprise you. Perhaps you think Christianity is like a hobby. It's like every, time, every Sunday I do this. Perhaps you think that this is just kind of like a club. You know, you can be on the inside or on the outside. Ultimately, there's no great benefit. It's just religion. Or you just think that Christianity is a, a bunch of ethical principles, so I live by these principles. Jesus was a good teacher. He was moral. But what Christianity is about, what Jesus is about, is bringing us to a place where we can be known by God. It's compared to a marriage relationship. And it's that very intimacy, the intimacy between a husband and wife, that's compared to what God presumes of us, namely exclusivity. In other words, because we're married to God, he expects our exclusive allegiance. There should be nothing that competes with our love of God. That you only have one God like this. There is none other. There's only one friend like this, and so ultimate allegiance goes to him. To reject or divide this allegiance is to commit treason. It is to sabotage the relationship. And so, brothers and sisters, are you friends of the world? Or are you friends of God? Verse 4 continues with an inference. If you look there in verse 4, it says, Therefore, therefore what? As a result of your adulterous affair with the world, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So you are an enemy of God if these things are more valuable to you than Christ himself. And God is an enemy of these people. God is an enemy of friends of the world because he's holy. The reason God is our enemy is because we do not value him as the most supreme in the universe. We value ourselves, our own passions, our desires, so much so that we view ourselves as being godlike. Everybody must bend to our wills. We view the wants, the longings, and desires of our hearts as the supreme standard for our existence. And the Bible calls this sin. So God is good to judge us, he's good to call out our disobedience. It's the most loving thing God can do since he constantly upholds his justice and his love. And he will oppose us because we are proud. Our only hope, however, is what God has done for us in Christ, the eternal son of God who took on flesh, who gave himself for us, Jesus of Nazareth. He lived a life of perfect trust and obedience to God. He relied on God, not on himself. He was not proud, he was humble. He was a model of humility, even humbling himself to the point of giving his life on the cross, giving his life away for our benefit so that we might live. So all who trust in him receive the life that Christ gives. 
He became a sacrifice, dying on the cross, dying in the place of everybody who would trust, not in God, but in themselves. And God raised him from the dead, proving, showing that what Christ has done is good and sufficient, and that if you bank on him, you're guaranteed life. And so all who repent and believe in Jesus Christ, they find forgiveness in God, and they are no longer enemies. All the fighting, quarrels, desires, passions, pride, all of that can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. Not because of anything you've done, that we've done, but because of what Christ has done. So the answer to the question, isn't it obvious that friendship with the world is enmity with God, is yes, it is obvious. There's a lot at stake here. But we look now at our last question. Do you suppose, this is in verse 5, do you suppose that the Bible meaninglessly says that God jealously wants you for himself? Do you suppose that the Bible meaninglessly says that God jealously, jealously wants you for himself? Does the jealousy of God bother you? Certainly the word that is used here to describe God's jealousy is only used of humans and it's often described as sinful jealousy. But of course with God, nothing is sinful, so God's jealousy is a pure form of desire, a pure form of envy. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 20. Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, verse 5. Listen to God's jealous desire for his people. You shall not bow down to false gods or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The picture is here, there's two people. One will worship the idols and hate God, and he will be jealous for them. And this jealousy will include God's wrath. But to the other group, the group that loves him, it, look there, it says that God would bless them to the thousands of generations. He will love them, and he will care for them. So which group are you in? Are you in the group that will despise God by seeking other things other than God? Or are you in the group that will seek God, love him, and obey him, and yield the blessing for thousands of generations? It's quite remarkable, actually, the, the comparison. You'd think that it would be the other way around, that God visits the iniquity of those who hate him to the thousands of generations, but he only shows kindness and love and mercy and compassion to only the third and the fourth generation. That's often our perception of the Old Testament. But it's the other way around. The fact that I became a Christian will yield fruit for thousands of generations. The fact that you are disobedient and hate God will only yield curse to the fourth generation. That means in your lifetime, you will see these curses. But after everything is gone, God can start afresh. I will never see the end of the blessings that God pours out on my offspring because that's how many, many blessings God gives to the thousand generations. In other words, the God of the Old Testament yearns, je yearns jealously for us because he desires us to have these blessings, to have these benefits. And when we scold these benefits, when we push them away, we're telling God, I don't need anything from you. I'd rather live my lifetime, see my generations, be comfortable with my three and four generations. I want thousands of generations. I want to continue this thing for thousands of years. If that means my offspring will see God's blessings. They will hear the gospel, they will believe, 
They will go forth in the nations and all peoples will come to Christ. If that's what that means, I want that. I do not want to just see 67 years of mediocre kind of pleasure. The greatest pleasure will come when in the end we see how God has blessed us because of his word, because of his purposes. So God's jealousy for you is a good thing. God yearns for you jealously because he wants the good for you. You can perhaps write to the side Exodus 34, 14 and Zechariah 8, verse 2. Both passages refer to God's jealousy as well. So does the Bible say meaningless things then? The question seems to presume that the person who's reading the Bible thinks, oh, this is all meaningless. And this is where we take a step back and say, God's word is not meaningless. Everything that God says in his word is intentional, purposeful, meant to bring us, to draw us near to him. And so we do well to heed its warning. So the answer to the question, do you suppose that the Bible meaninglessly says that God justly wants you for himself? The answer is, we should suppose that what the Bible says is true. We should suppose that what the Bible says is true. Specifically, that God yearns for his people with burning jealousy. He yearns for his people with burning jealousy. Deuteronomy 7. Open up just to Deuteronomy 7 again. I want you to see just the yearning that God has for us. This is in the Old Testament still. This is not the Gospels. This is not Jesus talking. This is Deuteronomy 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possessions. You can write that down. How would I describe what Christianity, what a church is to people on the outside? We are a treasured possession. That's what we are. We are a treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, it was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you are the fewest of all people, but it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord God has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king and Egypt, king of Egypt. Friends, we stand here today in Christ because God loved us, because he showed us his grace and his mercy. Would you believe that? Would you believe that the Lord rejoices over you, that he believes, he looks at you and he thinks of you as a treasured possession? Would you believe that? That's hard for us to believe. It's hard to, for us to believe that God loves us that way. And yet those who do not see God but love him, those are God's people. Those who love God and yet do not see him, how much more will they be blessed and not seeing so that when Jesus come, Christ comes and he reveals his glory, we will see him and we will know what his love meant. The most important thing Paul prays for, for the Ephesian church, is not, Lord, I pray that you give them good health. Lord, I pray that you give them prosperity. Lord, I pray that you would allow them to be successful in their work, in their studies. That is not the ultimate kingdom purposes of God in your life. Those are great things. They're good things. In the book of James, we're commanded, go and pray for sick people. I should be praying for people who are in the hospital. You should be praying for people who are sick. But ultimately, the thing that Paul prays for, it's just shocking, is that Christians might know the love of Christ. What is the greatest need that you have? To know that Jesus loves you. Paul prays not for non-Christians to know that God loves them. For Christians to know God loves them. That's why, because we forget. We forget that God is so attached to us. Like a husband is attached to his wife. God loves us. Ephesians chapter three says that we would have Christ dwelling in our hearts. That we might know the height, the breadth, the depth, the length. And he can't even contain himself. Paul can't even contain himself. And to know the love of Christ. That's what I really want you to know, Christians. So how do you know the love of Christ? You know the love of Christ 
when you look to the cross, what Jesus has done, and it melts everything away. When you say, I am utterly sinful, probably more than I know, and you look to the cross and you see, but I'm more loved than I dare dream. I'm more accepted by Christ than by my family, who know all my flaws. I'm more accepted by Christ than my spouse, who knows all the ins and the outs, the goods, the bad. For God to yearn for us jealously means that he knows us and still loves us. And so, brother, sister, would you know that love? I pray that God would give you that knowledge of his love. It would come for your heart, that it would sustain you, that it would encourage you. If you don't know that love, I invite you to call upon Christ, to look to the cross, to see your great need for forgiveness, and to repent, and to say, I have chased worthless things that will not be faithful to me. And now I want to chase the one who will be faithful to me. So receive Christ as your Savior. These are the three questions of the text, but moving on in verse 7, which is the center of the passage, we move to the commands of the text, and there are 10 of them. We won't spend too much time with them. I will give you some references that perhaps you can go home and read with your spouse or for lunch. You can read with some friends. The command that starts the section is in verse 7, submit yourselves to God. And the sandwich of submission to God in verse 10 is humble yourselves before the Lord. And in between that, you got the meat of what does it mean to submit and to humble ourselves before the Lord. So you start with submission, you end with submission. You start with humility, you end with humility. And that's based on Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In fact, in your Bibles, underline the verse that says, but he gives more grace. Because, as I've said before, the love of Christ shown to us is an act of grace. And then in the very next verse he says, but he gives more grace. What can be more gracious to us than God loving us? He gives more grace. There's more. Flows. And we will see at the end there are four promises that I believe captures that grace. Four promises that captures the grace. But first, let's look at these commandments. Submit yourselves to God. Humble yourselves before the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 34. What does it mean to submit ourselves to God? Very practically, resist the devil. Resist the devil. Fight against Satan. Fight against his schemes against your life. When he throws flaming darts at you, you throw flaming darts back with prayer. That's what Ephesians 6 says. You should clothe yourself in the strength of God's might that you would be able to withstand the battle. Not that is waged with flesh and blood, but the battle that is waged against the principalities, the evil powers, the demonic forces that are worked right now in the world. What do you do? You pray. The way that you will resist Satan is to pray. The very next verse, as we're moving in this sequence, is draw near to God. Draw near to God. This is language that's scattered throughout the book of Psalms. But to draw near to God doesn't mean just to bring my affectionate worship to Him. It means to align myself with His priorities. To become, to resist Satan, but then to positively move toward righteousness. To resist Satan, but to move toward the opposite of what Satan wants. Those values are, are outlined for us in James chapter 3, verse 13 to 18. One of the things that you'll see there is peace sows righteousness. So your goal is to draw near to God, to draw near to peace, to draw near to righteousness. The very next command that James gives is to cleanse our hands. And he calls us sinners to purify your hearts, you double-minded. So he says, cleanse yourselves and purify yourselves. This is uh, based on Psalm 24. The question of Psalm 24 is, who can ascend the holy mountain of God? In other words, who can be so righteous that they stand before God? The answer is nobody. 
None of us. Only one, Jesus Christ, who ascends the mountain, the mountain of Calvary, and gives himself as a sacrifice. The holiest person in the world, the only person who could ascend the mountain to reach God's glory, is slain. What does that mean for us? It means that all who come through Jesus Christ to God are cleansed and purified. That we can ascend the mountain, we can stand in the presence of God because of what Christ has done. The next three commands are, are pretty somber and they're very straightforward. James is calling us to repentance. He says, be wretched, mourn, and weep. These are the same, those three same verbs are used in Joel 2, verse 12, when God is calling the people of Israel to repentance for their lack of obedience. Then he says in verse 9, turn your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. But Paul, I thought we had to rejoice always. I thought we had to be happy all the time. I thought Christians were kind of the happy-go-lucky kind of people. The people that if everybody's mad and everybody's sad, the guy in my office who's a Christian will always be happy. But I don't think James disagrees with the joy that Paul tells us to have. I think the joy Paul tells us to have only comes from the morning James tells us we need to have. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 7, Paul will say, you need to have godly sorrow. Godly sorrow does not let you stay depressed and sad and discomforted over your sin. Godly sorrow moves you from discomfort, pain, sorrow for your sin to joy that is deep and lasting. In order to have the rejoice always that Paul says, you need to have the mourn, weep, and be wretched that James is telling you to have. Otherwise, we would never be joyful. Brothers and sisters, some of you have gone through this wretchedness, this mourning, this weeping, and you've come out on the other side rejoicing. And how sweet it is to come out of this mourning, this repentance, to on the other side know that you are a friend of God, to know that nothing can stand in your way, to know that though all hell will break out loose against us, God will not. He will sustain us. He will turn our mourning into laughter, our gloom into joy. We await that day, but not yet. For now, it is enough for us to say what verse 10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord. So, James is calling these people to repentance. He's saying, think on your sins. Think on the desires of your heart. Are you sinful? Are you putting other passions before Christ? If so, repent. That is the way to unity, repentance. Unity and peace will only come when we acknowledge our sin, God's righteousness, and turn away and turn to him. I wanna leave you with four promises four promises, and let these promises be like handlebars as you navigate life. These can go on your refrigerator. These promises can go on the bedroom mirror. These promises can go in the, on the dashboard of your car. They are promises that will get you through the mourning to the rejoicing, the gloom to the gladness. Promise number one, is in verse six, God gives grace to humble people. God gives grace to humble people. Promise number two, Satan will flee the fighters. Satan will flee the fighters. Those who fight against him, Satan will flee. Promise number three, God will draw near to those who draw near to him. God will draw near to those who draw near to him. In other words, as our wills, as our desires line up with what God wants, his purposes will become clearer and clearer in our lives. 
God will draw near to those who draw near to him. And finally, promise number four, God will exalt the humble. God will exalt the humble, but not yet, but not yet. For this will only happen when Jesus Christ comes back. When the one who is humbled, who is now the exalted one, will come back to judge the world. And so, as we prepare for him, let us humble ourselves so that he might exalt us in that day and that he might not judge us, but that he might call us friend. In conclusion, I want to draw our attention to the unity that the Spirit maintains among us. Brothers and sisters, it is easy for us to become proud, but as we've seen, humility is the source of all unity. So as we go forward, I encourage us to continue to think others more highly of ourselves, to look to others' needs in millions of ways, and to pray that God would keep us humble for his glory and for the good of the church. Amen. Let us pray now.